What I want to talk uh, about uh, today is uh, something called the Stockholm Statement, uh, which probably most of you didn't, don't know about. Uh, you, most of you probably have heard of the Washington Consensus, which was not really a consensus uh, in Washington. It was just a consensus between 15th Street in Washington and 19th Street in Washington. 15th Street is where the US Treasury 19th Street is where the IMF is. So it's a consensus among four streets in uh, Washington, D.C. But uh, it was a set of beliefs about what were good economic policies, policies that would lead to development and growth, uh, that were wi widely believed uh, in many, many cases imposed on developing countries. Um, when I arrived at the World Bank in 1997, uh, it had been the dominant ideology of the World Bank. Uh, the, um, there have been a whole series of, of uh, uh, chief economists uh, that had advocated variants of the Washington Consensus from Ann Kruger to Stan Fisher to Larry Summers. Uh, and yet, what struck me was that the ideas of the Washington Consensus were just the opposite of the ideas that I had been working for uh, when I was in the US government uh, as President Clinton, Bill Clinton's uh, chief economist. So there seemed to be a disconnect between what we were saying was right for the United States and what the World Bank was saying uh, was right for the rest of the world. So uh, I, I uh, began uh, uh, what was a, a systematic uh, attack against the Washington Consensus. Um, it was easier for me to convince my colleagues at the World Bank than it was those across the street at the IMF. Uh, my, my good friend Kaushik Basu, who was the last chief economist, uh, one said that my most important victory at the World Bank was reforming the IMF. Uh, the, the, uh, a year ago, uh, two, two years ago, uh, at the end of Kaushik Basu's term as chief economist, uh, he gathered uh, together uh, all the previous chief economists uh, from my time on except for one, uh, and a group of other uh, development economists to uh, analyze, was there a, a, a um, broader consensus, a new consensus about development strategies? The World Bank had recognized that the Washington consensus no longer represented what was good development policy, but no one had tried to articulate a, a small set of principles in the way that John Williamson had done in 1990. And so uh, we were hosted uh, by uh, CETA, the Swedish aid agency, and uh, we uh, came together and we formulated what was the Star Stockholm Statement. One of the things that uh, uh, brings me uh, to, to East Africa now is that we had a meeting in Dar es Salaam about uh, the applicability of some of these ideas uh, to uh, Tanzania's uh, economic uh, growth and development. And it was particularly uh, appropriate that we were talking about uh, the Stockholm Statement uh, in Tanzania because many of the ideas in uh, the Stockholm Statement are anticipated uh, in uh, the Rusha Declaration that Nereri had formulated uh, uh, a little over a uh, half century ago. And uh, Neri had uh, uh, articulated a, a number of other related ideas uh, in other of his essays like freedom and development. So what I want to do uh, today is to just very briefly to first try to describe some of the elements of this new, uh, I don't want to call it consensus, but at least uh, a new set of uh, principles and then to talk about a couple of the applications uh, of those principles. So the, the, um, there are eight, eight elements of those. The first is uh, GDP growth is not an end in itself. Uh, 
uh, a lot of development is focused on increasing uh, GDP. One of the things that was mentioned in the, uh, in the flattering uh, introductory comments was I was chair of an international commission on the measurement of uh, uh, economic performance and, so, uh, and social progress. And one of the things that, that this international commission concluded was that uh, uh, GDP uh, is not a good measure of well-being. The, the early formulators of uh, GDP, Simon Kuznets, uh, who got a Nobel Prize for his work, was actually very aware that GDP was not a good measure of well-being. But somehow in the decades that follow, people forgot that. And uh, increasingly, governments focused just on GDP. Uh, Robert Kennedy, who is a, 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 one of America's great statesmen, uh, once uh, said that GDP measures everything except which is important in life. Uh, and uh, um, it doesn't talk about sustainability. It doesn't talk about uh, uh, many other things. The, uh, it doesn't talk about health, uh, the environment. And it doesn't talk about equality. I'll come to that uh, in a second. Uh, the fact that GDP doesn't really summarize well, uh, well-being uh, also should be taken into account when we uh, measure poverty. One of the discussions we had in DAR related to what are called multidimensional measures of poverty. That, uh, and one of the exercises the, the, the World Bank did when I was uh, chief economist uh, of the World Bank was uh, Voices of the Poor, where we interviewed some 10,000 poor people and we asked them what was important for their well-being. Uh, it wasn't just the deprivation of income, which is obviously the most important, but they also were concerned about uh, insecurity and lack of voice. So um, the multidimensional measures of poverty uh, try to capture these and other aspects of poverty. It's important because there are some countries, such as Tanzania, where it appears that in spite of large expenditures of government on the eradication of poverty, there's been a very uh, much slower progress than would have been in, uh, thought. Uh, the technical term the economists say is the elasticity of poverty reduction relative to income was relatively low. The reason for this was that the metrics that were being used were only focusing on income poverty. And the investments, the large investments that were being made in, for instance, health, were not being reflected. Or the investments that were being made in education were not being reflected. And the returns to those investments may not show up for 20, 30 years. So it is important when one thinks about, uh, you know, metrics matter, and to think about uh, the broader concerns uh, that we uh, have. One of those concerns is the second one here, is development has to be inclusive. Here the simple idea is that increasing GDP doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is better off. The idea that everybody would be better off uh, is sometimes called trickle-down economics. Uh, as an American, I wish trickle-down economics were true, because we've given so much money to the top that if it were true, uh, most Americans would be a lot better off. The fact is, the average income of the bottom 90% of Americans has hardly changed in 40-some years. Just one statistic captures uh, what is going on. Uh, the median income of a full-time male worker, and the full-time workers are the lucky ones, the median income of a full-time male worker adjusted for inflation in the United States is the same today as it was 42 years ago. So it's been basically been two generations of stagnation. And life expectancy in the United States, unlike anywhere else uh, in the world, is actually declining. And especially male life expectancy. 
And again, the reason for this is these are what are called deaths of despair. Uh, life prospects are so bleak that people uh, have given up. And uh, the, the, the increase in deaths from suicide, alcoholism, drug overdose uh, have just been soaring. So uh, the point is, uh, it is very clear from this experience that just making a few people at the top rich doesn't necessarily benefit the vast majority of a country's uh, citizens. So uh, one actually has to have pro-poor uh, growth. One has to have policies uh, that are focused and try to ensure uh, inclusivity. One of the important insights that uh, I emphasized in my recent book called The Price of Inequality is that actually uh, societies that do not focus on inclusive growth pay a high price for that. It actually lowers uh, economic growth and economic performance overall. Uh, when I wrote my book, uh, The Price of Inequality, that was viewed to be a, a little bit of a, a, you might say, a left-wing perspective. Uh, but uh, it no longer is viewed that way. A large number of uh, econometric studies done by the IMF, and as most of you know, the IMF is not a left-wing organization. Um, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 have shown that uh, economies with more equality uh, do perform better, and that has been the basis of the IMF giving uh, advice to countries all over the world that they ought to focus uh, more on equality. The third element of the uh, Stockholm Statement it focuses on environment. Environmental sustainability is a requirement, not an option. Uh, this is, of course, uh, of a, a, a global concern. Global warming is having an effect on countries all over the world. Probably the worst effects are in those in the tropics. But the United States has been facing uh, floods, uh, fires, droughts, uh, natural disasters resulting from climate change that are costing our country hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So there's a real economic cost to the failure to address uh, sustainability. The fourth is the need to balance market, state, and community. Uh, one of the problems, as I'll reiterate in a few minutes, uh, is that the Washington consensus just focused on the market, didn't take uh, into account the key role that the state government at all levels plays. But one of the changes in our understandings is the important role the community plays as well. It's not just the market and the state. Uh, there's an important role for civil society, uh, for communities to play. And this is especially important as a, uh, you might say, both in terms of a check, uh, part of a system of checks and balances about the excesses of the market and the excesses of government. Um, but it's also important in terms of process, uh, individuals' value, participation in the decision of uh, that affect their lives. That was one of the points I made earlier in terms of uh, results of the voices of the poor. The fifth is providing for macroeconomic stability. But macroeconomic stability does not just mean balancing budgets, and particularly balancing budgets uh, by cutting expenditures, and it doesn't mean just focusing exclusively on inflation. On the other hand, uh, as uh, most of you probably know, not paying any attention to budget deficits uh, is also uh, not a good thing and is not sustainable. And uh, one of the challenges that Kenya will have to be faced, uh, and maybe we can talk about this more uh, in the question period, is uh, that uh, the budget deficit uh, has gotten out, uh, out of bounds. And uh, uh, the, the challenge will be to try to bring it back into some reasonable balance without uh, affecting the well-being of uh, uh, ordinary individuals. The sixth uh, aspect of the Stockholm Statement was attending to the impact uh, of global technology and inequality. 
Uh, globalization is one of the forces that countries all over the world have to deal with. Uh, some of you may know I, I wrote a book uh, shortly after leaving the World Bank uh, called Globalization and, uh, globalization and Its Discontents, in which I argued that the international rules of the game, uh, the way the international institutions work, uh, the international trade rules, were written in a way that were unfair to developing countries. One of the key issues, though, that I try to raise in the book is that uh, American workers and those in Europe have suffered from globalization. And there have been two problems, two reasons for this. Uh, the first is that the international rules of the game are unfair, but the unfairness is to workers in both the developed and developing countries. Uh, it, it unfairly benefits uh, corporations like Big Pharma, the drug, big drug companies, at the expense of ordinary citizens. And uh, this was one of the reasons that uh, there's been such criticism of, of many of these trade agreements. Uh, but the other thing is that if, as uh, most economists would argue, globalization has benefits, it means the society is better off as a whole. But it doesn't mean that all the citizens within that country are better off. Globalization, as economic theory we long explained, has large distributive consequences. There are winners and losers. And uh, globalization, if it's not well managed, can lead to large fractions of the population actually being worked off. The winners could have compensated the losers and still be better off. That's what economic theory says. But economic theory doesn't say the winners will compensate. And in political systems, which are not very adequately democratic, uh, the winners, the large capitalists, those who are at the top, haven't compensated the losers. And the result of this is that large fractions of the population have not done very well. So, the second problem with globalization is that we, and I say we, countries, the advanced countries all over the world, uh, and developing countries, have not done what they needed to do to make sure that most citizens are the winners from globalization. That requires, for instance, investments in uh, uh, human capital. Um, it, it requires often rewriting the rules of the market economy uh, to make sure that the bargaining power of workers uh, is increased to offset the weakening of bargaining power that results from globalization. And it may entail creating new instruments of redistribution within and between countries. The seventh uh, aspect of the Stockholm Statement is really a, a statement more about economic methodology uh, but it's a, a statement that has uh, considerable importance. It's that social norms and mindsets matter. Uh, I do want to uh, uh, tell you uh, the opposite of what your teachers have told you in your economic classes, uh, but some of what they have told you may have been wrong. Uh, the, in particular, the standard economic model, which is uh, taught everywhere, uh, uh, focuses on uh, rational individuals with uh, well-defined preferences. Uh, it's not asked where those preferences come, they just come with you when you're born. Um, it doesn't explain why uh, people in one country like one food and those in another country like another food. It just seems to be when you're born someplace, that's what you are. Uh, well, uh, an important uh, World Development Report uh, that came out in 2016 uh, recognized that that basic model is uh, very badly flawed. And it's based on a lot of research that's gone on in economics called behavioral economics that tries to introduce elements of psychology and sociology into standard economic analysis. 
one of the reasons why it's so important in the area of development is it introduces uh, important new ways of altering behavior, behavior such as savings and utility, that don't cost very much. And governments always want to alter behavior in ways that don't cost a lot. So, for instance, um, some of the dramatic uh, examples of this uh, that uh, good econometric studies uh, have, uh, have, 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 have analyzed is that exposure of individuals to, for instance, uh, soap operas, uh, television series, uh, can alter uh, fertility behavior. Uh, and what's so striking is that uh, uh, when the star uh, of the show, um, those who are of a similar age to those to the star of the show, have their behavior affected most? That people identify with oh, people identify with the star, and that affects uh, their uh, reproductive behavior. Um, there are many examples from many countries, from uh, India, from Brazil, uh, uh, verifying uh, the role that this can play in uh, in altering uh, behavior. The eighth is, and the last one I'm going to comment, are uh, the global policies uh, and the uh, focus on global policies and the responsibility of the international community. Uh, first, it recognizes the interdependence of countries, uh, but also that international agreements cover only parts of these arenas. Uh, the climate change for instance, uh, agreements, for instance, do not go far enough. Uh, they do not cover the cost of adaptation by poor countries. Well, let me describe and sort of try to re uh, re uh, review the ways in which the Stockholm Statement differs from the Washington Consensus. The Washington Consensus, as I mentioned, had a primary emphasis on markets. They had an inadequate treatment of those instances where markets do not lead to efficient outcomes that would be called market failures. It had a very narrow view of macro stability, typically focusing on price stability. It um, had a very narrow conception of the goals of development. Uh, now we realize that there are broader goals and also many more instruments. And just to illustrate these, uh, traditionally, Monetary policy focused just on interventions in uh, short-term interest rates by open market operations. Uh, now, during the East, during the financial crisis of 2008, finally monetary policy began to recognize that there are many more instruments, uh, for instance, uh, associated with quantitative easing and macroprudential regulation. Um, there are more instruments of macro stability. One of the big uh, controversies that my book, uh, Globalization and Its Discontent Set Off, had to do with my views that I articulated there on capital controls. Um, the restrictions that affect the ability of capital to go in and out of a country overnight. Uh, China has succeeded in part maintaining its stability by having relatively strong capital controls. Uh, the uh, antipathy to the capital, the, the views that I uh, articulated in, in that book were so strong that um, the chief economist of the IMF uh, attacked me as uh, selling uh, snake oil. Um, I don't know if you know what snake oil is, but it's a particular thing that that Americans used to sell uh, that had no real value, but, but had all kinds of medicinal values. So when you want to say somebody is really selling something that, that is hokum, uh, is bogus, you say he's selling snake oil. So, so uh, that's what they uh, accuse me. Now, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't like to say I told you so, but uh, I just said it. Um, the, the, in 2010, the IMF officially changed its view. Their, what they call their new institutional view is that under certain circumstances, 
capital controls can be an important part of policy. And in the case of Iceland's uh, uh, response to the global financial crisis, they endorsed the use of capital controls. Another example of these uh, instruments um, that it is industrial policies, which can be important instruments for development of transformation. During the Washington census, those policies were soundly attacked. Uh, they said it was picking winners, uh, and they said markets do a lot better job. Interestingly, the World Bank now, uh, beginning for the last several chief economists, have argue that countries ought to have industrial policies. So they've done uh, a reversal. One other instrument of uh, policy that's they changed their mind is they used to be very, uh, both the IMF and World Bank used to be very critical of development banks. Now, I always thought that was a very peculiar view because the World Bank was a development bank. So you would have thought that uh, the World Bank would say that uh, development banks are important institutions. But somehow they, their view was that while they were important, other development banks were dangerous. Uh, that view has now changed, and uh, it's widely recognized a key role that development banks uh, can play. There are also, uh, as we go into the 21st century, uh, many goal, broader goals that were not incorporated uh, in earlier articulate uh, perspectives, particularly the Washington Census. Obviously, uh, the issues of climate change were not included. Uh, there was uh, no focus on inclusivity, on inequality. And uh, today, there are further challenges facing developing countries. One of the other important differences between the Washington Consensus and the Stockholm Statement is that the Stockholm Statement provides a clear distinction between means and goals. For instance, privatization and markets themselves are not ends in themselves. They are only possibly means to the broader goals that I've described earlier, and I say possibly because if they're not well designed, they can be antithetical to those goals. Poorly designed privatization, that I sometimes call briberizations, uh, actually uh, uh, can uh, impede uh, development. Uh, and other variables need to be looked at through this kind of lens and whether it's a means or an end in itself, and that includes inflation, budget deficits, current account deficits. At the same time, as I've said before, not attending to these variables in a timely way may make it difficult to achieve uh, other goals. So this is the, the broad framework that I wanted to um, spend uh, most of my time talking about. But I, the second part of the talk, I want to uh, uh, give a couple of examples of, of uh, the application of some of these ideas. Um, and the first, uh, that I'm going to spend the most time on is uh, to the broad issue of development strategy. The countries around the, uh, uh, in the world that have been most successful in development have been East Asia countries. Uh, and their growth has been more successful than anybody had anticipated, say, 50 years ago. Uh, there was a famous book written by uh, Gurna Myrdal, who got a Nobel Prize, uh, called The Asian Drama. Uh, and it was published in, in just uh, uh, 40, uh, in 1969, just uh, uh, 49 years ago. Uh, and what he said in that book was that the prospects for Asia were bleak the likelihood that it would be able to emerge from the centuries of poverty in which it had been mired were very, very poor. Now, uh, one of the important lessons of that book uh, that all of you who are becoming uh, economists should take to heart is never make an unambiguous forecast like that. Um, because no sooner did he make that statement than East Asia started to grow. And it grew 
very, very rapidly. So the question is, what led to that uh, enormous growth? And that was a subject of a book that I helped uh, write for the World Bank called The East Asia Miracle. The basic idea uh, of uh, the success of the East Asian countries, and it wasn't just one country, it was basically every one of the East Asian countries, was manufacturing export-led growth. Uh, and uh, that insight that manufacturing export-led growth has led many countries uh, around the world to say, and particularly those in Africa, to say we ought to do the same thing. But you can't repeat history. Uh, the world in 2018 is different from the world that, uh, of 1980 or 1975. And so opportunities today are different from what they were, both for, in some cases, better and in other cases, worse. In particular, the possibility of export manufacturing export-led growth being, quote, the solution to Africa's problem is uh, very low, very bleak, for a simple reason that uh, manufacturing has been the victim of its own success. The increases in productivity in manufacturing have far exceeded the increases in demand. And that means that globally, employment in manufacturing is going down. That means that it's going to be hard for any country to succeed based just on manufacturing. Manufacturing can be an important component of the development transformation, but only one component. And that's especially true for Sub-Saharan Africa because virtually all the growth in the labor force in the world in the next 25 years is going to occur in Sub-Saharan Africa. The increase in the world labor force is going to be very, very large. And even if Sub-Saharan Africa got all the manufacturing jobs that currently exist in China, it would make only a small dent in the providing jobs for the new entrants in the labor force. So it is an important part of the strategy, but it's only one part of the developmental strategy. So that leads us to the question, why was export manufacturing export-led growth so successful? And is there some other way that African countries who can't now avail themselves of the same strategy, is there some other way that they could get the benefits that manufacturing export red growth provided to East Asia? Well, to answer that question, what we have to do is deconstruct why was it that manufacturing export red growth was so successful? And the reason was that it provided simultaneously several things that were necessary for development. It provided jobs, particularly in labor-intensive manufacturing. It provided foreign exchange that was uh, important uh, uh, for uh, development, providing for needed uh, raw uh, needed imported materials for. Uh, uh, economic growth, and it was important for learning. Uh, what accounts for the difference between standards of living today and what they were, <clears throat> say, 250 years ago, is a little bit an increase in capital, but mostly learning. It was uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, a change in mindsets, uh, the notion that change was possible and the scientific method of learning that led to the enormous uh, uh, increases in standards of living that have occurred in the last 250 years. So 
as important as the gap in resources between Sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the world, equally important or more important are the gaps in knowledge. In the case of East Asia, manufacturing provided a way for the countries to learn more. If they were going to compete in chips or in, in making airplane parts or in making automobiles, they had to learn a lot about manufacturing. Uh, and that meant they had to learn a lot about it, lots of things. Um, in the case, for instance, of Korea, uh, the IMF and the World Bank had said to them as they emerged from the Korean War, uh, and Korea wanted to know what its comparative advantage was, um, the IMF and World Bank said, you should specialize, your comparative advantage was growing rice. You should focus on growing rice. And Korea responded saying, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, we have higher aspirations that even if we were the most efficient rice grower in the world, our standard of living would still be not that high. So what they recognized, what was important, was not static comparative advantage, but dynamic comparative advantage. A dynamic comparative advantage that was created through the process of learning. And the result of that was that Korea wound up being more efficient in steel production than even the best American firms. So they learned, they learned how to learn, and manufacturing played an important role. So these are at least three of the important components that manufacturing wrapped up in one thing, jobs, foreign exchange, and learning. Well, for the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa today, they're not gonna be able to have a, a, a a single thing like manufacturing for in the same role. They're going to need a multi-pronged strategy. And uh, it will have to have, as I say, several important components. Manufacturing, expanding manufacturing will be one part of it. But another important part is going to be improving productivity in agriculture. In much of Sub-Saharan Africa, the vast majority of the citizens still earn their living off of agriculture. And productivity in agriculture is still a fraction of the productivity elsewhere in the world. So increases in productivity in agriculture could increase standards of living by a very large amount. And those increases in standards of living can be uh, in areas that are export-oriented and can lead to uh, generate foreign exchange, can generate uh, jobs and processing agricultural goods. Uh, and uh, modern agriculture is very, is very learning intensive, or at least can be. The third important area, which is of growing significance in all countries, is the service sector. Just by way of comparison, in the United States, manufacturing is only about 9% of employment in GDP. The service sector is uh, more than 70%. You know, uh, I, I don't want to keep going on about the foolishness of President Trump, but it's hard not to. Uh, another example uh, is uh, he's talked about the coal miners. Um, there are uh, about 50,000 coal miners in the United States. There are 250,000 people engaged in installation of solar panels. Saving a few jobs in coal mining is not going to solve America's unemployment problem. Expanding solar uh, panels is going to provide cheaper electricity, cleaner electricity, and contribute to global uh, prevention of global warming. Or to give you another example, 
In the United States, uh, there are about 250,000 people engaged in all the extractive industries put together, coal, iron ore. There are more professional sports people than those totally engaged in extractive industries. So if you want to, rather than worry about extraction, promote sports. It may not have the same resonance for Trump, but in terms of jobs and quality jobs, it's actually more important. So the service sector is uh, the sector of the future. There's many different components of the service sector. But the lesson I want to uh, highlight is if there are differences in standards of living across countries, if service sector is more than 70% of the of the of the of the uh, uh, employment, it is differences in productivity in the service sector that are absolutely critical for standards of living. And so, supporting the service sector, increasing the efficiency of the service sector, moving towards a more productive service sector is critical. There are a few African countries that are actually succeeding in doing this. Uh, Namibia is a country where over seventy percent of the population is a uh, 70 percent of GDP is involved in the service sector and that includes a very highly productive uh, uh, tourism sector. So the bottom line of all this is that while manufacturing export-led economy won't provide the way forward for sub-Saharan Africa, there is a multi-pronged approach that is available that can achieve all that manufacturing export-led growth uh, did for East Asia and address the specific problems that we have today in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the world. The second issue I want to talk about very briefly uh, is uh, the special challenges posed by natural resources, which is sometimes called the resource curse. And uh, the the, the phenomenon is that those countries with lots of natural resources uh, would have been expected to grow better than those without natural resources, but the facts are that they have grown more slowly and more unequally. Uh, it's not inevitable. There are a few countries that have managed their resources well, in Norway, Chile, Botswana, uh, Namibia are countries that uh, provide example. It's both a political and economic problem. Uh, natural resource economies give rise to rent seeking, um, but it's also uh, a, a, a series of economic problems, the most important of which is that the export of natural resources leads to high foreign exchange rate, making other sectors uh, uncompetitive. And at the same time, the natural resources do not create many jobs. Unfortunately, many of the same consequences arise in a difficult way from uh, foreign investment in infrastructure. Because the inflow of capital for uh, infrastructure or other forms of, of, of foreign aid, other forms of capital inflows, lead, as important as they may be, also lead to a higher foreign exchange rate. And the higher foreign exchange rate makes it more difficult to export and uh, makes uh, countries more vulnerable to import com uh, competition from imports. So the, the basic lesson is that uh, there are a whole set of, of policies that the successful countries that I uh, mentioned before have managed both the political and economic problems. Um, uh, uh, they, for instance, uh, they found that there is a way of achieving a competitive and a stable foreign exchange rate, and this can be an important element, uh, instrument of industrial policy. There are multiple and often complementary tools for managing the exchange rate, including direct intervention, capital count requirements, and monetary policy. And the effectiveness of the foreign exchange rate as a tool for development can be enhanced with complementary industrial policy tools. And the, these, these are examples of instruments that China and some other uh, 
uh, industries, uh, I, I, China and other countries have used very effectively. Um, one can also enhance value-added activities uh, associated with uh, agriculture or uh, other natural uh, resources. So the reason I emphasize this is that um, central to success of development is the structural transformation of society. And that understanding has led to movement from a focus on projects to policies and then to institutions. Um, and uh, that's corresponded to the realization of importance, not just the physical capital, but human capital, social capital, and knowledge capital. Um, all countries are in need of structural transformation. Uh, in the case of China right now, they're going from expert-led growth to domestic demand-driven growth. Uh, in natural so source economies, uh, they're moving to diverse away diversify away from dependence on natural resources. Uh, and in Africa, both between and within sectors, from traditional to modern agriculture, from lower to higher productivity service, uh, services. Um, agriculture can play an important role, as I said before, in this uh, structural transformation. Uh, the important thing is that markets on their own don't manage these transformations well. Uh, and there is a strong, Theoretical reason for this, impediments imposed by capital market imperfections uh, mean that those needing to move from a sector that's in decline to a sector that's expanding don't have the resources to do that. And there are also important externalities and coordination failures. So the result of this is uh, the government needs to assume an important role uh, and uh, the fact that there is an important role for government and the community is one of the central themes of this talk. So, uh, um, uh, one of the uh, aspects of this new understanding of the role of government is, uh, and one of the lessons that came out of these successful countries in East Asia was thinking about the government as the development state. Um, while the role of government in setting and enforcing the rules, preventing exploitation, negative externalities, encouraging activities with positive externalities, and so forth, um, uh, is true in all countries, it's especially important uh, in uh, developing countries. And one of the insights is that there has to be social cohesion, and social cohesion requires and facilitates inclusive growth. Um, so let me just conclude is the Stockholm Statement provides guidance on how to ensure strong and inclusive growth. I try to illustrate this with two examples, one in the case of natural resources, the other of how countries in Africa are going to address the challenge posed by the lack of availability of the strategy that works so well in East Asia. Um, the, Stockholm Statement um, uh, emphasized uh, that limitations and the failures of the Washington Consensus with a broader range of objective instruments and a more balanced view of the participation of different participants in the development process. Um, with the appropriate development strategy, one could avoid the natural resource curse and environmental degradation. One can achieve the principles that are stated in the Stockholm Statement. It requires a comprehensive development strategy, a portfolio of instruments, and uh, it's going to be essential to get a balance between the market, the state, and the community. Thank you. Okay. Regards to uh, global technology and equality, and specifically so about the recent uh, intention by the IMF to endorse cryptocurrencies as as an alternative of fiat currency, and also as regards to macroeconomic challenges in Africa, specifically in sub-Saharan, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and mostly in our country Kenya. Uh, 
the, the macroeconomic challenge of the budget deficits and unemployment, how, what strategies would you propose to address these issues? Thank you. They're both uh, very good questions. Uh, on the issue of cryptocurrency, uh, my view is uh, that particularly, I, I, let me first answer the question as, as an American. Uh, the dollar is a perfectly good currency. Uh, I don't know why they need another currency called Bitcoin or uh, uh, anything. Uh, there is a reason. Uh, the reason that people want to use another currency is money laundering, uh, illicit activities, uh, all kinds of uh, naughty things that people shouldn't be doing. So my view is uh, the government should actually outlaw these uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, I, I said that to uh, 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 a number of reporters, and it got widely quoted, uh, which uh, a lot of the people in the uh, Bitcoin industry uh, and those who are making money out of trading them didn't, uh, didn't like. But the fact is that no one has ever explained what is the economic rationale for the cryptocurrencies other than uh, uh, avoid uh, uh, illicit activities. And the reason why this is so important is that Governments all over the world are trying to make banking systems more transparent. They're making it more transparent to prevent, to, to stop uh, not only illicit activities like money laundering, tax avoidance and evasion, uh, terrorism. Um, but if you are closing down on, uh, if you're making the banking system more transparent, and then opening up a whole vast new way of avoiding transparency by going through cryptocurrency, you're going to have all the bad activity go into cryptocurrencies, and the banking system will be weakened as you support the cryptocurrency, and you will, you will fail to achieve the objectives of trying to make uh, the system, uh, our, our financial system, more transparent. To put it another way, if you have a world in which you have argued for transparency and then you allow a big hole in that system, all the naughty people will go through that illicit hole. So uh, I think it's very important for governments not to allow cryptocurrency. I think there were, uh, and, and some governments are moving, like Korea, are move, South Korea are moving in that direction. Uh, the uh, second uh, question is how do uh, how does a country like uh, Kenya uh, address the problem of a large budget deficit of 8% so of uh, uh, GDP without causing an economic downturn you know the standard way if you don't there, there, there are basically uh, three ways that you can get rid of a deficit. Uh, the first is grow the economy. That's what politicians always like, because uh, they can say, OK, we're going to wave a magic wand. The economy is going to go larger. We're going to get more revenues, and the deficit will disappear. Well, uh, that almost never happens on its own. So you can't, you know, you, you can pray, and uh, politicians do that all the time, uh, but I wouldn't count on it. So that leaves two other ways. Either raise taxes or cut expenditures. And uh, politically, neither of those are attractive, but there are some differences. Uh, in most developing countries, uh, Cutting expenditures uh, is very, very costly. Uh, if you cut infrastructure, uh, there's huge infrastructure needs. If you cut poverty programs, poverty rates will go up. And Kenya has done a lot of successes in reducing poverty in the last 10 years. And you don't want to lose what you accomplished. Uh, every area, you, you can think of the huge cost of the cutting back of expenditures. So to me, the most 
uh, strategic decision is to increase taxes. Then the question is what kind of taxes to increase? Well, going back to the Stockholm Statement, item number uh, three focused on the importance of the environment. And one way that you can Im improve the environment is by imposing environmental taxes, a carbon tax, a tax on the use of uh, in the emission of carbon is a way that raises locks of revenue and at the same time discourages the use of carbon. And has a third advantage, because households and firms will have to spend money to retrofit themselves for the higher price of carbon. They'll have to make investments um, in buildings and in electricity generation or, and a whole set of other, other investments. It actually can, unlike other kinds of taxes, it can actually stimulate the economy. And what you really don't want to do is the other mechanisms tend to uh, reduce economic growth. This can actually uh, enhance economic growth, especially if you measure economic growth correctly, taking into account environmental degradation. So the first thing I would do is to have a whole set of environmental taxes to encourage people to behave better environmentally. And this can raise substantial amounts of revenue. At, at the same time, it improves economic performance. The second is uh, a whole set of taxes that are progressive in nature, and especially taxes that are not associated with large distortions. Uh, one set of taxes that uh, satisfy both of those are progressive property taxes. Uh, economists differ about a lot of things. Uh, if you tax labor, workers may not work as much. If you tax savings, uh, they may not save as much. But if you tax the land in Kenya, the land is not going to leave the country. It's here to stay. So land taxes are non-distortionary, and particularly when you design progressive land taxes, it can actually target, uh, achieve an increase in inequity. Uh, there's a famous economist in the United States called Henry George, who actually argued in the 19th century that the land tax was the most best progressive tax. Uh, he had a book called Progress and Poverty, so he was really concerned about uh, that. Capital gains taxes are another way of taxes on the increase in the value of assets, because a lot of those gains in the assets values are uh, accidental, particularly asset values of land. Uh, they just, you know, in the process of urbanization, land values increase a lot, and that capital gain is unearned. It just happened. You didn't do anything for it. And therefore, uh, a tax on capital gain um, was, uh, is both progressive and can generate a lot of uh, revenue. In my mind, the biggest mistake that, one of the biggest mistakes that the Clinton administration made uh, over my opposition, I have to, they, they made several uh, mistakes, but one of the mistakes was to lower the tax on capital gains. And that increased inequality, increased speculation, led to more instability, and led to more inequality. And uh, it was simply uh, a re because the vast, vast majority of the capital gains were accruing to those at the very top. In the United States, the result of the preferential treatment of capital gains is uh, that the richest Americans pay lower taxes than ordinary Americans. And Warren Buffett, one of the richest Americans, actually was very outspoken. He said it is wrong that he pays a lower tax rate than a secretary. And the reason he pays a lower tax rate than a secretary is because he pays lower taxes on capital gains and almost all of his income is in the form of capital gains. My name is Radha Upadhyay. I'm a research fellow at IDS here at University of Nairobi. And it's a real privilege to 
to be here. I have two questions. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it kind of captures the sort of philosophy of a lot of the lecturers at IDS. Um, you specifically mentioned uh, the role of industrial policy. And uh, whilst I very much agree there is a role of industrial policy, and this might be partly because I think there isn't enough research, I feel that there is this gap where we know we can't follow the East Asian model, but then besides improving the business environment, um, it's not clear what uh, African countries can do. So if we could have your reflections on that. And my second question is a bit of a bugbear, but it's about methodological issues and methodology in economics. And I do feel that the over-reliance on kind of mainstream methods, particularly in African economics, means that we are unable to think outside the box and come up with more kind of um, context-specific policy solutions. So some thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, on industrial policies, as I said, this has been a, a, a major uh, focus uh, of the World Bank. Um, we did a, uh, I did a book with uh, Justin Nguyen, who was the chief economist of the World Bank uh, about five, six years ago, and with uh, the Minister of Development from South Africa. And the, the title of the book is Industrial Poli something like Industrial Policies for Africa. Uh, and it was really focused on trying to uh, find the lessons of industrial policies for uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in response to the kind of question uh, that you posed. Uh, that uh, it, these policies, as you say, go well beyond just providing a uh, conducive atmosphere for the private sector. Uh, it, it goes to try to encourage specific uh, sectors and technologies. Now let me just say a minute about uh, why these were very criticized at one time. Um, the, the people on the right said uh, uh, governments should not be in the business of picking winners. Uh, and the market does a better job. But, uh, and obviously governments should not strive to pick losers, that's clear. Uh, but the, the history of government is that uh, governments all over the world have been very successful in picking winners. And there are large market failures that can easily be identified uh, that where the government intervention can lead to faster economic uh, growth. Actually, what I, we argue in this book is that every country, including the United States, have industrial policies. The only, in the United States, most of our industrial policies are hidden in the Defense Department um, because uh, that's the only way we can get uh, away with it. But as you know, the internet was a result of government investments. And the government really did lead to, uh, it was government spending that led to, uh, pro research programs that led to the creation of the internet. And it was within the Defense Department. Uh, the, um, one way of thinking about it is that every piece of legislation actually favors one sector relative to another. So for instance, in the United States, our bankruptcy law uh, bankruptcy laws say who gets paid when a firm can't pay its debts, when its debts exceed uh, its assets. Uh, in, the, in most countries, when a, country, when a company goes bankrupt, uh, the first peop, uh, people who get paid are the workers. G good reason for that, because there's no other way they can survive. In the United States, it's an exception. Uh, when nobody was paying attention, the banks succeeded in passing a law that said that in the event of bankruptcy, the banks, and particularly the derivatives, get paid first. Well, that was a policy that encouraged derivatives, those speculative activities that led to the, the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, 
So it was an industrial policy. It was a bad industrial policy that encouraged excessive risky activities, but it was an industrial policy. But when you make investments in education and infrastructure, you are shaping the economy, helping some part of the economy at the expense of some other part of the economy. So you can't get away from the issue of industrial policy. Now, I talked to, in my talk, I talked about one instrument of industrial policy, and that is the foreign exchange rate. Keeping a low, a competitive and stable exchange rate is an important instrument of, of, uh, of industrial policy. And uh, I mentioned another one, which is development banks. Uh, in East Asia, one of the things that they did was simply provide credit to sectors that they wanted to grow. Uh, often the credit was not even very subsidized. Some of you know, may know that one of the areas of, uh, in which my research focused for a long time was credit rationing. And in the presence of asymmetric information, uh, there will be failures of equity and credit markets and that there will be equity and credit rationing. And so access to credit is very limited. And that's true, in, especially true in developing countries. So that having mechanisms for the provision of credit and allocating that credit carefully can be an important instrument of industrial policy. Um, so, and finally, uh, government procurement policies can be used judiciously, carefully, as an instrument of industrial policy. Now let me say on all of these things, there has to be a lot of transparency, and there has to be a, lot, a, 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 a strong press and strong media to make sure that there are not abuses of industrial policy. But when there is a strong media, when there is sufficient transparency, industrial policies can and have provided been a, an important mechanism for, for development. On, on the second question on, on um, methodology, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, that's been the main, main battle of my whole life, is uh, the mainstream, you might call it the, 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 the main, the orthodoxy uh, has been uh, uh, excessively narrow. And this is particularly true in developing countries, I think. Or let me put it like this, the consequences have been particularly true, but the mainstream in the United States led, I blame it, for the, the financial crisis of 2008. The models not only didn't foresee that crisis, they said the crisis couldn't occur, and because they put up blinders, they didn't take the actions that would have prevented the creation of the crisis. It was a man-made crisis. It wasn't an earthquake. It wasn't, uh, you've had problems from weather. It wasn't caused by weather. It wasn't caused a natural disaster. It was something we did to ourselves. And we did it to ourselves because we used the wrong models. People like Bernanke and Greenspan were using mainstream models, and they believed it. And rather than listening to critics, just one little brief story. I was at Davos, which is uh, uh, where uh, every January a lot of the mucky mucks get together and uh, talk. Uh, and they, they just talk. Um, but uh, in 2008, I believe, um, the, uh, 2009, um, uh, the discussion, there were a whole group of central bankers uh, sitting on the podium. And uh, they said, the discussion was uh, 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 about the financial crisis, and they all said, no one could have foreseen it. And then there were about three or four of us, Noriel Rubini and me and a couple of other people, sitting in the front row, and we all raised our hands, and we said, we said, we pointed this out last year and the year before and the year before, but you couldn't hear us. And you couldn't hear us because you're my, your mindset was so shaped, blinded, by your models that you couldn't hear criticisms of what was going on. And that's an important lesson that if you have too narrow of a vision, you won't see either the problems that are occurring or solutions 
policies that might get you out of those problems. And that's why I emphasize, that's why in the Stockholm Statement, we emphasize, for instance, uh, the importance of behavioral economics, the importance of sociology and psychology, and that economics needs to be broadened out beyond those conventional models.